today's guest is Ryan Sudrajat, an Indonesian ethnomusicologist and musician who is also known as Baseput, his electronic music project. Baseput's idea is to link between the voices and instruments of the indigenous people and the modular synthesizer to create a new form of experience in the modular world. Baseput hopes to connect between the legacies and the messages of the ancestors from the past in the futuristic modern world. My name is Giovanni Grandi and this is Let's Talk Music with Raptus. Thank you for the opportunity, Giovanni, by the way. Well, thank you very much for being with us today, Ryan. It's a real pleasure. Um, I would like to start right away uh, by talking a bit more, if you want, about your musical journey. Uh, you know, it's quite an extended one. Sure, that'll be great. Yes, please. Yeah. So um, how did you start with music and uh, how did you end up uh, where you are right now, both in terms of uh, artistic direction and also um, why you end up playing the modular synthesizer as your instrument of choice? So the first one, I started music when I was 12 years old. I play pop music. It's a bit popular. Of course, you know the Beatles. And I listened to I Wanna Hold Your Hand, Yesterday, Hey Jude, the famous songs from them. And then I started the band and then uh, bought my first guitar. And then from there, I listened to The Alternative and then Shoegaze and then um, like Britpop. You know, of course, Indonesia at that time has many influence from Britpop and American brands as well. I think it's uh, in the beginning of the thousand-ish. And then uh, play Radiohead cover songs and stuff as a band in the uh, senior and junior high school. And then after that, uh, time goes by. Uh, in a short uh, story, I went to Melbourne to continue uh, my master degree in there. Sorry, where was your your first experience as a musician based? Where, like in Bandung? Oh yeah, in Bandung. Yeah, in okay. Bandung. Yes, yeah. I was born and raised in Bandung at that time. So since kindergarten, and then my bachelor degree, and I finished my bachelor in Bandung, and I started to I went to Melbourne in 2018 in Monash University, uh, continue uh, master's in ethnomusicology and musicology. And right in Melbourne, I went to many places like a music store uh, in Melbourne, of course, you know, found sound and other uh, musical instruments as well. And then I found one community called Aussie Wigglers. And then, yes, uh, the magics happened there. And I started to build my first modular synthesizer in 2019, right in the middle of my uh, master degree. You know what? Because the intention at the first time to start at modular synthesizer is not the musical things, but it's actually in the middle of my research, I get bored and I get easily stressed because of the research, because I took master by research studies in Melbourne. And then I get easily uh, stressed because of the journals and everything. And right in the middle, I found the um, modular synthesizer when I try to patch the cable from one model to model, it's just bring, uh, reduce my stress uh, level. Ah, because I, see. I think it's very, yeah, it's very, it's very, um, uh, make me calm at that time. Because when I patch this one and patch this one and my sensory uh, hand and then uh, sensory play and everything, it's become my, oh, I get easily uh, cheer up by playing a modular synthesizer by playing the cables and the knobs and I can continue my uh, research in university. So I think the intention at that time is to bring my uh, anxious level or stress level become more manageable in the middle of my um, research. So it's not quite common to <laughs> start a modular synthesizer because for some reason, maybe other people start because like the music, or like the sound, and then like the timbre of the uh, oscillators and stuff. But I think at that point, I started uh, to like because of the, it can, it can, it can make me calm in the middle of my uh, uh, research. Wow, that's fascinating. And what what was your research about at that time? Yeah, it's actually about the uh, death ritual. So my research held in Kalimantan Island, uh, the third biggest island in the world, or called uh, Borneo internationally. So I uh, identify and about the function of the meaning of the gong, like the big gong, because in the death ritual, gongs is always used in the middle of a ritual, in the 
initial ritual and the end of ritual. So I become more interested with the uh, gong itself and what is the uh, function and meaning why the people in there has to have to use the gong for the ritual for the as not only as the musical instrument but also the gong is also used as the place to store the bloods from the animals uh, which is already sacrificed for example buffaloes and then uh, chicken and then uh, pigs and stuff um, so I think wow, this musical instrument is not only as a musical instrument that being played by the people in the village or the, in the in the island, but also as the tools, which is very important in their ritual. So I think that's my uh, curiosity at that time. And I also um, are interested um, to research about the, uh, as become my research in master degree. Wow, that is uh, very fascinating. And uh, I my... I have an impression, a suggestion from this story, which you tell me if it's a bit too far-fetched, but I see a kind of an analogy between the instruments you were studying and the modular synthesizer for you, which is not just a musical instrument, but a tool for a ritual. Because, you know, your ritual of calming yourself and bringing your uh, anxiety <laughs> down <laughs> that's a good point. That's a good point, Giovanni. I think that's really true because I not uh, I not only use uh, or see music or musical instrument as a tool itself, but I think it's also one of my um, body's extension. For example, I have a hands or I have a feet, but when I see a guitar, for example, when I see modular instrument or maybe as a when I see drums, for example, other musical instrument, I see that I see them as the extension of my body. So I think when I play with them, I become into one with the musical instrument and also with modular synthesizer. And I think that's also uh, bring me um, to become as one with the musical instrument. It's not separated. I think, and also uh, continuing what you've also said, it's true that, yeah, I think playing modular instrument is become my ritual. Uh, to to be like uh, you know uh, deeply connected with the musical instruments itself because at the first time I play bass I play guitar and drums there's always something has to be hit or strum or it has to be you know like a violin or cello but playing with modular synthesizer for me I think it has to be uh, change my perspective at that time I have to play with the cables and I have to play with the knobs and how to you know, produce a sound with the cables and sound. I think at the first time uh, for me, that was a challenge to uh, produce a sound, which is um, until now my uh, my music, you can also listen to uh, in my in Spotify or Bandcamps, which is, I think the, 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 the journey to there, I think it's quite uh, far and also um, long and winding road as a bit of sad because when I, I think uh, Raptors, of course, uh, I have to say that Usta, I think it's very, uh, it's also, it's very, uh, it's very true that it's my first uh, Raptors. And of course, it, that'll be uh, the first uh, sequencer I use. And I, I'm, I'm become unseparated with the uh, Raptors, especially with the Usta itself, because I can imagine if I have to compose in modular synthesizer without Usta, I think, I cannot imagine that. So I think <laughs> it's just become one. Uh, yeah, that, that was part of the original design, you know, to treat the instrument as an extension of the of the artist's mind. Because the whole point, I think, uh, in making music and making art as a whole is that you need to waste uh, the, the least amount of time between your idea and your uh, production. Let's, that's true. Let's that's this, true. You know, this very uh, ordinary term. But. And uh, uh, thinking about um, instruments, and, uh, and you mentioned that you you came from uh, uh, the the pop music and Brit pop music, but uh, you also play traditional music, am I right? That's right, that's right, yes. And mm -hmm. is it something that you have been uh, uh, trained uh, um, like from your childhood or is something that you approached at a later stage? 
Oh, that's interesting uh, question because uh, when we also uh, when I was playing traditional music, uh, the first one is a, like a zither. It's called kecapi from uh, Sundanese uh, ethnic group in West Java, where I uh, grew up. So it's quite. Uh, it has uh, eight strings, and I have, we have to play that like a piano in there. But we have to play the left hand with the bass and right hand as a melody, and then. Um, it's become more um, it's I think it was quite hard for me to uh, play that instrument but I think I was um, 15 years old at that time so it's not quite uh, it's not quite uh, small at that time but I think 15 years old is to bring me the understanding because I think my, my dad uh, and also my mom's also uh, let me to uh, take a course took took a course of the um, Kecapi, and then also play. I also play flute, uh, like uh, it's called suling, in Sundanese name. And uh, because of I played that instrument, I went to. I've been to Belgium at that time, two thousand and eight, and France, and also to Luxembourg, and then to uh, Netherlands in Utrecht. Um, I uh, tour with the Indonesian embassy to promote Indonesian uh, tourism at that time so I was 18 years old and it become it brings me that oh okay so with playing traditional music with playing traditional music and also can uh, show about my identity to the world because for example uh, if I play guitar for example if I bring that to America for example of course people already know guitar and then people already uh, know about this instrument but I play kachapi and I play suling, and I bring that to uh, Europe, for example. Of course, people doesn't know that before. So I think at that time, I believe that, oh, if I play traditional music, I can bring my identity and I can introduce the instrument, which is uh, which people maybe doesn't know before. So I think that's the intention to play traditional music uh, compared to the uh, like Britpop or modern and pop music. And with that, it brings me understanding that Okay, I have to still uh, play traditional music, but also I have to play and also have to understand about other music, which is global, so I can incorporate that with my uh, music. So that's what happened with uh, Baseput, because uh, I play Mordler Synthesizer. That's a futuristic um, musical instrument, I can say. And then, but the idea and the core idea of Baseput is to uh, bring the legacy or bring the message of the ancestor in the terms, in the form of uh, Eurorack or modular synthesizer. So that's why the samples and the sound and the scales by the help of Raptus Usta, I can bring that tonality, I can bring the scales of the traditional music, which is I played on in West Java and Kalimantan. So that's really suits with my uh, idea of playing music with Baseput Giovanni. Excellent. I was uh, about to drive the conversation towards uh, Baseput, that uh, because it is your um, uh, the, the project where uh, the electronic music is involved, and uh, I have a question, and I'm not sure if I will be able to phrase it properly. But when you mentioned the ancestors, um, you also mentioned other, um, let's say, uh, tradition other than the Western Java, where you come from, because uh, we know that Indonesia is quite vast and there are a lot of uh, ethnic groups with different tradition and different musical traditions. And I was curious to know, how do you approach uh, those traditions and uh, those ancestors? Uh, or in other words, uh, um, do the ancestors need to be your ancestors to be <laughs> featured in Baseput? Interesting. So I spent um, a years, not only years. I've been I've been uh, researching, and also I've been uh, research about the people of, especially about the Kalimantan people, for more than nine years until now. I think it's ten years. Yeah, yeah. It's, all, it's almost ten years. So that my my initial um, research in two thousand and fourteen to Kalimantan. So I went back and forth to Kalimantan and then to Bandung, Kalimantan to Bandung. So I think. Uh, it's really important for me to stay in the place and to communicate in the place. It's not only like, of course, you know, like ethnomusicologists like have to go to the area and then stay like one or two weeks and then go again and then uh, <laughs> be researched and that. And I have to live with them. I have to understand about 
the identity. I have to understand about the ideology. I have to understand why these people play this instrument in the field, not in the, for example, in a home. Why they play this instrument towards the sunrise, not on the sunset, sunset for example. Mm. So I think that ideas and that messages and uh, the ideologies, I have to understand that deeply rooted. So I have to spend, I've, I've been spent like a month or maybe even years in the field. So it brings me the understanding of their ancestor, for example. So I can speak their language now. I can speak their three languages and three dialects now in Kalimantan because Kalimantan has uh, more than 58 uh, dialects, which is, has different languages as well. So I can only speak three uh, languages of them, the Katingan and the Ngajunis and also the Otdanum. But of course, to understand their languages, it brings me the understanding of their culture as well. Because, for example, if I learn uh, how to speak Italian, for example, Italy, Italian, of course. Is it Italy or Italian? Speak Italian. Yeah, Italian. Yeah, Italian, yeah, yeah, yeah of course. Italian. When I speak Italian, for example, uh, indirectly, I, I can also understand about the culture itself. So I think it brings me a lot of, uh, not only the culture, the culinary, for example, it can bring some also why these people also act differently with other ethnic groups, for example. So I think um, the first thing first, I have to spend uh, like uh, a year or months in there. So it can bring me the understanding, oh, how this is how the ancestors also uh, think and their ancestors also think. Because back in the past, everything is connected as the Austronesian people. Uh, for example, Kalimantan and Sundanese and West Java, it becomes one island. But because of the uh, water level of the sea level is also up and the uh, the down uh, area is also being drowned by the water and become separated by the ge geographical aspects. But I think at the moment, at that time, in the, in the past, everything is connected. So that's why the languages, the culture, the customary law, has a has also similarities between them so i think it's not quite difficult for me at that time to um understand and also to uh to make sense about the ancestors and then also the idea of the uh, ethnic group in indonesia wow well, beautiful answer i love this idea of uh, culture as being a matter of uh, education and understanding rather than just a matter of uh, uh, who your father, who your mother is and where you were born. That's right. mentioned that uh, you did a lot of um, field recording as an ethnomusicologist over your um, during your uh, field uh, researchers and uh, I was curious to know if uh, um, part of those field recordings actually became um, part of your music or if you kept the world of uh, research and uh, music um, separate uh, sample wise I see, I see, great. Yeah, I'll bring my field recorders as well to the field and I'll record a uh, couple of the instruments and also I s managed to sample one of the oldest instruments and also one of the oldest gong in the village. And I sample it back to the uh, modeler synthesizer and I can play that uh, in my composition. So I think my first EP called Astungkara and uh, the first tracks also which is I also recorded in here for Frap Tools. I think that's also my first track, which is I'm proudly say that I use the samples and I, you know, the, the behind the scene of the Astunkara, uh, Giovanni is also uh, composed like not more than 10 minutes with Usta and also set the gate and also set the CV and set the randoms and then boom. It happens. <laughs> so I think because of the, I, 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 have, I have a clear idea of what's, I'm going to do with modular synthesizer and also I've I know what to do with the samples and it's become like it's very quick it's very good of course with the help of Usta and then with the sample wise of course uh, there's a couple of artifacts in the field like uh, uh, the background noise and also have to 
it's not quite clear if we can record in the field because there's a uh, cicada or cicada's uh, voice and also voice of the you know background noises. So I think I managed to sample one time at the at on the evening at that time on a village, and I've that's what I'm used in Astungkara track, which is uh, is it f- uh, for yeah for fractals. Wow, awesome. And uh, well, since uh, we are getting uh, a bit uh, technical about your musical style, I think it, we can uh, take a listen to the patch you made for this episode and then uh, we can meet again to discuss it. Great. Okay, so let me explain the patch. So basically, Usta is the brain of this composition. So everything's being triggered, and also all the CVs and the gates and everything's from Usta. So this is incredible. So I've used Usta since its release from 2019, and I like it so much. Until now, I'm still using it. 
in my composition in modulation and synthesizer. So that's very good. So basically, um, I use all the outputs, eight of the CVs and then also eight of the gates, and triggering all the samples in uh, Rossum Assimilator. So I use that. For example, this is the sound of the, like the oscillator from Bukla samples. And then the Bukla samples of the sine wave a bit lower. This is a bit um, different. It's called Reong and this is the gong. And then Kantilan and then um, Reong as well and then Gundring and then other uh, Balinese Gamlan. I sampled as well. So all the samples I stored in here and all the individual channels um, uh, from the assimilators into the mixed up. This is the first sample and then a mono, mono and then stereo. And then the rest of four channels, it goes into a knob farm, higher low, stereo, stereo, and basically all the eight channels goes into this mixer. And the last channel is from the um, make noise morphogen. Basically, all the eight channels I pre recorded and sampled that into morphogen. So, basically, this is the same, but it's being reversed to the left. This is normal. Uh, so, this is normal without reverb. And then I, I can pitch it up like uh, octave up or maybe reverse and put a delay so if it plays together sounds like this and then the rest of the from the mixer it goes to this happy nerding fx8 xl Stereo and then goes to the Cosmotronic uh, Messer as a compressor and then goes to the No Farm Oats as the output model and then goes to Rio into my interface. And then everything, everything's being triggered and then all the um, like uh, pitch shifting and then stages random and everything goes from Usta. So that's incredible. So the first question I have about your patch is about the sounds that I have already introduced in like a few minutes ago. And uh, so you are using the assimilator as your main voice, right? Yes, that's right. Yeah. Uh, so the samples that you have in the assimilator uh, are made by you, right? Yes. Yeah. Mm hmm. And uh, what is, uh, if you want, uh, what is your process of uh, like making samples and then uh, making music with them? Great. So there are two samples in there. So we can divide that into the sine wave and also the gongs itself. So mm. the first one I sampled with the oscillator of Bukla when I was in Mass in Melbourne. So there's a huge of Bukla's uh, uh, systems in there. So I managed to sample each of the oscillator, I forgot the name, sorry for that, but I can check and let you know later about mm -hmm. the uh, oscillators. But the, the, I believe that's uh, the black knobs and mm -hmm. also the blue knobs. I think I forgot the, the, the series of the oscillator, but I think it sounds very huge. And I sampled that through the Golden Edge uh, preamp, MK2, I believe. And I put that straight into my um, audio interface. So I managed to sample two minutes of the sine wave and then uh, two minutes of the square wave and then two minutes of the, is it pulse width or triangle? I'm not sure. So I put that in the uh, DIW and then I mm -hmm. cut into one minute and put that in my SM letter, each of the oscillators. And I use the sine wave for the low bass uh, voice, for example, dum, dum, mm. is it between like C2 and C1 to bring the uh, low uh, section of the frequency. So if I could play in the club, for example, there's a subwoofer, the, the room between dum, dum, it, becomes, <laughs> it hits your chest you know, because of the low frequency. I think I like to play it with the lowest notes on the between C2 and C1. So I think it's very good if we play in the club, so we can bring the vibration of the room itself. But that's yeah, there is nothing there. more disappointing than a sound <laughs> system that cannot hold your frequency range, right? 
<laughs> you, you understand that, of course, yeah. So I think that's the oscillator, and also I can uh, play with the oscillator as a higher pitch, like uh, between C3 and C4 to bring the um, uh, higher pitch of the oscillator. And then the uh, the, the gamelan or the, the gong itself, I sampled that when I was in Kalimantan. I record that. Uh, with my uh, Sennheiser MKH416, which is I'm using now in here, uh, it's a condenser and it's a shotgun mic, but it's very, uh, it's very good and it's very uh, handy in the humid uh, area. For example, in Kalimantan, in Borneo, so I record that, and also I use the Rode NT5. With, uh, it's I think it's cardioid, which is quite close to the cone of the gong itself to 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 capture about the sound of the percussion of the gong itself to to bring the attack which is this microphone to bring the low and also the ambience because it's just omni uh, super cardioid as well so it brings uh not only the focus to the uh front of the microphone but also the the idea and also the context of the sound itself so i think that's the uh the technical aspect and how i record the sample and of course i have to uh, record that on the evening because on the afternoon and in the morning people in the village working and then uh, see so and then uh, to bring their motorcycle and it's very noisy in there in the village so of course <laughs> I have to record on the evening by the permission of the village because I have to record like Doom! and then I have to wait for a couple of seconds Doom! and then you know what happened people from the other area and other uh, village come because, and then see, and then look at me in the room. What's happening? Is there any dead people in here? They said, <laughs> because the gongs also attract people. It, it's also as a sign. If there's any people uh, die in the village, they have to struck the gong like three times without stopping. Doom, <laughs> doom. And then I have to record that. So I have to, to be silent. And the people from the other village come by the boat because it's river. And then come, no, what, what, what happened? What happened? Oh, no, no, I've recorded a sample. I said, so they misunderstood. There's something, uh, someone died on the elf, on the evening. <laughs> so it's a bit misunderstood. And also it's a story. It's just quite, um, uh, it's quite, it's good as a thought, as a story. So I think that's the technical aspect of how I record everything and becomes a sample in my uh, sampler. Uh, just to know if I am following correctly, is this the same gong you were mentioning at the beginning? The one used in death rituals that uh, ho hosts the, the the blood of the animals. Yes, yes, but I think um, it's it's the same it's the same uh, type of gong. But I think um, the gong which is stored at the blood of the animals is a bit different because they have to store in different location. But I think it's not the actual gong which is stored of the blood. So I think it's different gong which is. As the same type, because the gong itself is quite old, Giovanni, I think. It's more than like 500 years, one of the villagers mentioned. So it's not quite a common uh, musical instrument. So, for example, one village maybe only have one gong like that. So if there's any ritual or death ritual, they have to, uh, you know, uh, bring that from the um, uh, the house, which is quite uh, old, and they have to be um, put the ritual in the gong itself so it's ready to be used in the ritual so because of the rarities and also quite old not many people and not it's not like a musical instrument which is you can play every day so if there's any death ritual if there's any um, uh, performance of the ritual it's being played again and being ritual but if it's not they will lock it up in the uh, store in the house yeah, it's almost like a, maybe a church bell for Catholic countries that has a specific yeah. social function more than uh, like a, just a simple artistic uh, function as a, any other musical instrument. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Yeah, it's quite, it's quite similar with that because um, uh, it's being a sacred ritual, a sacred instrument also. It's not like... Um, it's not for playing for the uh, people or the twin children, but of course if there's any ritual, so everything's become cleaned and also ready to be a ritual. So it depends if there's any event or not. And how do you handle the, the pitch of this instrument in your, in your composition? And we are slowly getting to the tuning topic, but I want to That's approach right. this topic very carefully. <laughs> This is interesting. Yeah, I know that you are also expert in this, uh, you know, with the pitch and everything. But I think the challenge, of course, for me at, at that time is the pitch itself. So um, 
I have to repeat that again in the uh, the AW, uh, for example, because there's no scale or tonality which is quite fixed on the village. So it's not like a pentatonic. So there are five sets of gongs. Uh, dun, 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 and it's not quite being tuned as a scale itself, like pentatonic. It's not, if, if we see that as a pers- uh, Western perspective, as classical music, it's not in tune, of course. So it's not in tune like, what scale is this? No, of course not, because it's not meant to be played as a scale or like orchestra. But I think that's the beauty of it. So we're not being um, um, focused with the tone or the pitch itself, but I think the ambience of the ritual, of the performance ritual, the fields, and also we have to drink some uh, like fermented rice wine, and also we have to dance in the ritual. So all the sensory aspects of the rituals itself, it affects us like a five senses, like eyes and then uh, tongue. We can sense uh, the drink itself. We can hear something. We can hear the vibration. So I think it brings the uh, ritual experience or performance ritual experience into one. So I think if we can go back to the pitch itself, I have to return again in the uh, the AW and then to suit with like you also uh, here in Astungkara part. So. I manage one gong, and then I return to D, for example. Everything's being tuned in D and put all the samples in there so I can use the pitch uh, from Usta to control all the scales in there. So I think it's uh, that's that's the key. Because at the beginning, I have to, it's not quite, it's, it's really different. I have to make a, a five pitch of the gong itself, which is, for example, D, E, and then uh F and then G A for example, and I play with the gate, so it's quite hard to play with that. So I became oh, this is not the right way to play with the pitch and especially with the usta. So I set the gong in D, everything the lower and then the higher, and then I set the pitch from usta. It really helps me better to compose. Oh, so I misunderstood in how to play with that one because it's quite hard at that time. So when I uh, met Usta and then play, wow, this is the right instrument to play with the gong as my extension of my body in modular synthesizer. So in uh, the way I uh, play with uh, modular or Eurorack, uh, it's like a uh, like a one piece band, for example, we have a drum, we have bass, we have a guitar, for example, because Usta has uh, eight gates and eight CVs, and also uh, assimilators, also eight samples. So it really fits uh, really good. So I have my, for example, hi hats, I have my snare, I have my tom, I have my kick, and then I have my bass, I have my everything in there. So it means uh, it's, it's really. Um, really suits my composition uh, playing with Usta as well. So it can translate what I'm, what's in my head playing with traditional instrument and through modular synthesizer, it becomes, wow, this is it. So I don't have this anymore. And then if you can see my rack or my system, it's really small because I met that as a portable system. I can play live wherever I want under seven kilograms and put that in a cabin. And also I can, put in my, back, my backpack and I think that's the idea of my system is to portability and then to play it live but also not to losing its context of my um, idea of playing music in modular synthesizer. Mm, mine as well. I, I totally agree in, in the, on this matter because I, I ended up with the formula that uh, it needs me at less than half the time uh, less than half the concert time to set up and uh, the stage and to leave the stage combined. Otherwise, it's not worth playing a gig, you know. So if right. I have to play like half an hour and it takes me one hour just to set up the stage, <laughs> I'm like, yeah, no, no, no. So I understand right. the importance of portability, yes. especially in the yes. world of uh, electronic And music. especially because I don't have any crews and also ha- doesn't have any people to help me. For example, if I play in the different locations. So I have to, okay, this is my system. I have to plug my power. I have to plug my outputs and that's it. So everything yeah, is being sound exactly. checked at home, you know? So I already um, understand about this uh, this one and then volume and everything. So, okay, 
let's start. You don't need any sound check. Uh, for example, the sound engineer. No, I've already set up. Okay, let's start. For example, <laughs> so I think it's very uh, time. And then you uh, become the you know. sound engineer's best friend immediately. <laughs> and then, well, this is the guy I'm looking for. They said. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, and they are going to become all super enjoyable. And then they say, "Do you need anything?" And that's it. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> So you mentioned that, that you um, ended up using Usta to change the pitch of your repitch the samples. And I was uh, finally, uh, I'm about to ask uh, um, if you uh, use any uh, particular scale on the Usta sequencer, uh, if you make your own and um, this kind of things. Yeah. So I think I have to uh, thanks uh, to... Um Um, I think the, is it uh, the Atom? Is it the software? Atom? Atom? Atom, yeah. Yeah, the Atom. Yeah, I think it's very suits uh, me well with the uh, playing with my scale because I have a specific scale, for example, the Sundanese scale, and then it's pentatonic from Kalimantan, for example. For example, I have to play a different scale with that. So I put that with Atom and then installed that in Ustas, but I wish I could more than four scales in Usta Giovanni. I think that'll be great. Yeah, Maybe I can understand. Eight. Yeah, yeah, I think that'll be great. But I think I understand as well. That's the limit of the uh, Usta to four scale. I think that's Rolo. It's already uh, it suits my uh, scales. Of course, you have list of scale, which is huge scales in there in your manual book. When I read that at the first time, wow, you have so many scales in here. But I have That I've, was I'm, Simone's, uh, Simone's <laughs> approach towards uh, scales because <laughs> I suggested to include microtonal scales and it was like, yeah. okay, let's use them all. <laughs> and so I spent <laughs> so many days and nights That's just fantastic. scales. <laughs> But then again, if you, if, you're, if you think that you are running out of uh, user scales, uh, there are also uh, four other scales per each of the EDOs. So I don't know which oh. kind, of, uh, because uh, if you are uh, using, I don't know, maybe 12 uh, Edo or 15 or whatever, but mm -hmm. you have four scales also for the 15 Edo, 22 Edo, and uh, um, 20, 19, 22, and 24 Edos. So basically you can program other scales Uh, of course, you have to calculate the offset from a different starting point. But for example, if you use the 24 Edo, it's just twice as thick as the 12 Edo. So you will have 24 uh, microtones. And so one out of two is a semitone and you can start offsetting your ah, scales from there. I see. I see. Interesting. I, sh I should look more into that. I should look more mm. into that. Yeah, that's good. Yeah, but then again, I don't want to uh, lead the conversation too too far from the starting topic. You were you were talking about the, your your scales, and I think that uh, your setup is probably the ideal scenario to use. Uh, Uh, microtonal scales uh, in the Eurorack world because you have a digital uh, sound source and so you can be a bit more uh, confident about the output because if you were using for example analog oscillators whose tracking might not be always perfect <laughs> Uh, if you if you are uh, you know focusing on uh, you know a five cents different but the difference between uh, the average note but then the actual oscillator has a deviation <laughs> of five cents it becomes uh, a bit more tricky and actually in the in the previous episode um, the where I interviewed Trevor Trella he Uh, he is working on just intonation at the moment and he's using the Usta as well, but he got rid of the whole scales uh, concept and he just uses raw voltages because his, <laughs> uh, his voices are analog and he was like, okay, I'm just trusting my ears and when I find that's the right. note that's in tune, I just go for it. So, uh, All or nothing, yeah. <laughs> that's why I'm considering Brenzo as well because Brenzo has, a, has a features that can lock the 
the the oscillators, right? The pitch, right? Mm, Is yeah. that right? Yeah. 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 So I was considering that, but then when I was in modular grid and I, you know, have a draft of my rack, and then wow, it's become huge. <laughs> it's become quite bigger, you know, like my party. But I'm considering, but I'm considering in the future if I have uh, like a second uh, system. I will consider the like analog oscillators and also not playing in samples and feel the timbre and the organics of the uh, analog oscillator. I think I've considering that so much, but but in the meantime, I think this is quite uh, portable and also I don't have to worry about the pitch and then <laughs> the, the, the deficient like you've mentioned because everything is being digital and then I'm not a purist that it's not it's not quite thick the sound of course it's digital of course i'm not quite purist but i think at the moment is i have to enjoy and i'm the first thing first that i'm enjoying playing this system and the uh, composition is quite quick it's very quick because of the helps of usta i think it's just incredible sequencer and the circular of the usta it brings so much inspiration that from start and then and start and then because i played a couple of sequencer back in the past like track uh a system and track style i think it's just bring me okay four 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 and then 16 and then eight i think it's just like make me stuck at the moment so with playing with the usta i think circular and then in the beginning oh i have to uh, it, it brings me to the you know uh, like the concept of reincarnation for example because when we have to born to the world and then we manage to be an adult and then we go and then end and then we go back again and then we have to live again death again live again i think to look up with the a philosophy of the Usta in my perspective, I think it brings me to the uh, so much inspiration to connect with my uh, ideas of playing music in modular and uh, as an ethnomusicologist as well, Giovanni. Wow, that's amazing. So, thank you very much. And uh, um, you are, from what I saw in your uh, in your videos, um, your instrument. Uh, that you built also for uh, like as an extension of your uh, musical practice and with, with with the main scope of portability seems to be very fixed in terms of patching with the tendrils cables and uh, I was curious to learn more about your approach do you uh, still patch as you were doing like in your research uh, your search years that you mentioned in the beginning do you still uh, use the physically the, the cables or you have reached a sort of uh, instrument design that's uh, satisfying and that you tend to leave it untouched most of the time wow that's interesting and also i've been thinking this a lot too because yes when i use chandrils i think the first one um the intention of using chandrils is become uh play life because when i used a straight cable at that time i can't play with the knobs because all the cables with the straight knobs is covering all the knobs and then uh, the potential and all the feathers because ah, it's become because I, I also really like to play it live and tweak on the fly and also pitching on the fly on live because I think it brings me the um, uh, intention of playing live music so when I found tendrils and then wow this is really good because I have some kind of fixed patch in that time but I also have to bring my straight cables when I'm playing live so I can play uh patching live when i was playing live for example connecting all the uh like the lfos to uh pitch and then lfos to randomize and stuff like that so i think uh at the same point i can play like i have i have a fixed patch but if i'm playing live i bring my straight cables and then i can modify it on the fly as i want to um you know uh modify everything but i think if we if if it's become fixed of course but uh the, the lines of the patch it become fixed but the idea i think i can connect and i can bring all the uh pitches from usta for example to a simulator so everything's happened internally and it's being changed internally compared to uh we can see physically about the uh page and cables so i think even though the fix or the patch is fixed but i think what happens internally Uh, on the uh, system, I think it's just change every day as I play other instruments. For example, I've mentioned mentioned you the other day that I've explored 
techno music, for example. Yeah, so that would patch... have been my next question, actually. So please, let's <laughs> yeah. talk about techno. <laughs> yeah, even though even though the patch is like that, like you've uh, seen on my uh, Astunkara patch, everything is being connected from Usta to Assimilator, Assimilator to Mixer and everything. But what happens inside there, it's just different ideas and different um, brains of my composition. So I think um that's the 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 interesting thing what happens in modern synthesizer even though we can uh connect physically by the cables and the page cables what i think the brains itself what happened in the system i think it's just uh interesting and we can we can play uh differently every day literally because in the previous uh, um, in the previous interview Trevor brought up the concept of uh, the um, uh, the early days of electronic music of a patch being an instrument definition so whenever you make a patch you are like defining your instrument besides just uh, creating the music so it's just, it's like a more primordial level of music making than just picking an instrument and playing but then again even if the instrument, you are now expanding this concept because even if the instrument definition is the same, like the structure is the same, uh, the way you can make it interact is uh, it has still a lot of room to explore. Like you said, with, with the same instrument, you can play the Pasiput uh, um, traditional and electronic mixture. You can play techno and without even mostly touching a cable. And that is like a fascinating concept. Yeah, yeah. I think, I think uh, maybe other people, of course, has a different perspective and opinion in how to play the modeler because some, some of my friends also said that it has to be patched right away. If you finish playing, today and patch everything let it clean and then tomorrow you have to patch again so that's playing modeler synthesizer so some people think that also some people think like uh like uh um, like me for example but i think in my understanding whatever the concepts and whatever the instrument as long as you have the idea and the intention of the goal the sun what we'd like to reach in the future i think that's the most interesting one because i've seen a lot of my friends that trap in modular synthesizer or eurorack world that oh because they seen this performance of ambient music for example oh because of they seen of this techno music on youtube so they become buy some modules that maybe okay this modules is good this model is good and then boom the rack is there but they don't know what to do about that for example okay i'm playing, playing techno music okay techno and then because the intention is quite quite strong, of course. Oh, I'm going to play ambient, for example. It's not. It's, I'm, I'm going. I'm not saying that this is wrong or not. But if we have the intention of the goal of music, we would like to play. Uh, uh, what we'd like to do in the future, for example, I think it's just really saving time, saving money, of course, and then saving everything. For example, I know what to do with modular synthesizer. I would like to play traditional music, but in terms of Eurorack. So I think that's the intention. So I become very quick with the samples and everything. And yeah, it's there. But if I'm just playing music and I don't know what to do, what kind of genre, what kind of uh, different of improvisation, for example, it will, you know, kills my time right away. And I being trapped in the selling and buying stuffs and then uh, i think it's just not quite good for me but i think for some people of course the intention for example uh i would like to release music but some people playing eurorack maybe they don't they want they don't want to release any music they just have to playing uh in the room and then uh playing peacefully i think it's also good but i think the intention that what makes differences as long as the purpose is clear, it can be whatever purpose, and then you are you are good to go. But uh, I agree that recently there has been this idea that Eurorack is almost the like the modular synthesizer is the the universal answer to all the problems in music, which is of course <laughs> not the case. I mean, it, it is uh, always, it must serve a purpose. And uh, to some, I, I for example, I, I, I follow yours, the, the same approach as yours, even though the way I play the modular synthesizer is, a compl- is the opposite. I am more of a musician who unpatches everything. And maybe I like to focus on, uh, you know, creating the same patch over and over again to see if, if how, 
the heat changes from one time and the other, but there are plenty of other tasks that I have to do that I just do straight in Logic Pro or Ableton yeah. Live because it's faster. As we said in the beginning, the, the <laughs> instrument needs to sa make you save time, <laughs> not waste <That's> right. time. <laughs> well, of course, it's not a waste of time if you are enjoying the process, but if it becomes a source of frustration, then there is something wrong somewhere. That's right, because the idea is really fast. If it if we don't record and we it's very quick you know in being being uh you know erased from our minds so for example if I have any ideas okay I have this one idea I have to op, uh, fire up my system and then put the audio interface in Logic Pro and I have to record that right away because if I have to okay turn this one first and then and then oh it's become uh, distracting so I have to find a solution how to uh, record for example record in being stereo for example people also like from their modular stereo in and out to audio interface I think it's only two channel that's good and also I've tried like eight channels like with uh, ADAT and then ad through my audio interface and 10 channels okay it's good I have separations of my channels but it becomes overwhelming and then it's become time consuming to mix all yeah, the tracks. For example. <laughs> <laughs> you know? So oh okay, this is not good for me. Okay. I have to mix everything in my system and then stir it in and that's it. <laughs> Yeah, I do the same. I mean, uh, it's fun to think that you can then mix and compress your tracks separately. Yes. But then again, you ask yourself, why? That's right. Because, <laughs> because, because, I mean, just to obtain the same effect as you would obtain straight away with just a left and right couple. So <laughs> why just work eight extra hours to go to get to the same end That's point? right. And also, and also the feeling, Gil, funny. I think with the stereo track, I think the feelings, what's inside there, for example, if I record Astunkara in 10 mm -hmm. minutes and then tomorrow I record Astunkara again, it's different. It's different feeling that, okay, I have to improvise in this minute. I have to make this one into this, like, ratchet in this one with Usta. And then in tomorrow, I play the Yastun Kara track again. It becomes different because that's the beauty of the modular, I think, even though it's the same instrument, same patching, but the intention of the improvise something and then to add something is quite different and based on the feeling itself. I think it's just like you're playing piano, for example, playing this composition, and then you manage to, okay, I'm going to improvise two bars in here or four bars. I think it's just what happens on the zone itself. So I think it's just interesting to see the uh, like improvisation in the middle of the composition with modular. You have mentioned um, Astunkara, which we have briefly heard here and there throughout this interview, but and that I will also link in the episode description. But you briefly hinted at your current techno exploration. So please, if you want to expand on that topic. <laughs> oh, yes. Yeah. So, yeah, you know what? As the... As a musician, of course, we have the level of distress and then level of the boredom that, okay, I play ambient, I play traditional music, and I'm playing soundscape and noise. It becomes, mm, why don't us? Why don't, why don't I just try different things? For example, uh, techno, because I think it's uh, there's also different technos and also different uh, eras of technos, of course. But I straight into like uh, like Detroit techno, for example. I think it's quite interesting to learn about how the uh, pioneers of techno music to compose. Uh, techno music at that time compared to now for example we have the uh, for example techno in Berlin for example I've never been to Berlin so I don't know about the scene of the techno itself but I listen to the from the YouTube from the podcast I think it's quite interesting to bring that um, uh, techno's music so when I play my techno music I just play straight with my samples so i have a samples that i uh got it from my friends also like a kicks of the 909 or 808 and then but i also still use the uh, gamelan instruments between that and also still using the book class uh oscillator samples as a bass and also yeah because um the idea to play techno music is to 
try something new in my composition in modular synthesizer and i uh, went to different communities in Technos and then to learn that through YouTube. I think it's quite wide and also uh, I'm still learning. I'm still learning. I'm still learning about that uh, Technos and it's uh, how to uh, the techniques, for example, like we mentioned about the to play in different, uh, you know, uh, the signature times, for example, not only four, but on the five as play in seven, for example, with the melody itself. So it's become the infinite loop of the melody. I think it's interesting, uh, different techniques, how to play the rumble kick, for example, in the back of the tracks, like the constant kick, like and we have to mix that differently. I think it's quite interesting to see a different approach and how to bring the rumble uh, kicks into a different people or something. So that's, I'm still learning, I'm still learning. I'm not quite say that I'm an expert in techno, of course not, but I'm still learning how to play the techno music. Yeah, I like this approach and I like the, the fact of uh, like the importance of not being an expert in a certain in a certain topic, which is a feeling that I personally like a lot because uh, you, you, it's like uh, when you, you, there is the, the thrill of having something new to learn uh, every day, which is yes. also part. I, I think it, it's very similar to, to the whole academic research thing. You know, when you when you know you're on a path, but you're not around yet and but you see the progress you're making every day you're like slowly <laughs> unfolding a topic and yes. um, that that's I mean it is something uh, which is really in, invaluable and it is very similar to practicing and learning new stuff and learning also new instruments um, which is something that uh, yeah I also like to do you know getting a new instrument and learn how to play that you always learn something that you can transfer to your other uh, music and it, this That's applies right. also um, when learning instruments or when learning new genres as you are yes. telling us I think I think for me uh, it's it's important to note that the for example album or playing live or releasing something I think it's just a bonus but I think for me, it's the most important one for me. I think it's the process itself to encounter uh, new friends, for example, uh, new communities and new understanding of how to play music. I think just, just the beauty of the playing music. So music can bring me to other different countries and different communities. I think um, the, the bonus, it's like a roller coaster. And then you up, oh, that's good. And then you down again, oh, it's not interesting. And then you up mm -hmm. again, wow, well, okay, it's different feelings, you know, playing music and then whatever, all the genders and forms of the music itself, whether a traditional music or modular synthesizer, I think uh, the outputs of the playing live or album releasing something is just a bonus. But I think the beauty of it, that's along the journey I encountered uh, you, Giovanni, and Simone from Fraptos and other new friends and electronic music, which is uh, very kind to me and to able to teach me through the internet. And then, you know, it's just amazing all the, of how the uh, Eurek uh, communities works. And it's just like uh, different bondings. And then also, it's just very kind. It's very kind. I've never met someone which is quite rude in Eurek or modular communities. It's just you know, really, really, really good for me so far. Yeah, I agree. But at the same time, I don't think that the uh, album or playing live is simply a, a bonus. I think that, I mean, if you are talking about, uh, you know, the the whole like music industry mindset, then I agree. It's, it's, super, it's not necessary. But I think that it is important during the, a creative journey to let go of some of your music and uh, to put it out in the world because uh, at a certain point uh, your music is no longer yours alone and uh, that's it's, right it's also of part of your audience and you need to you know to um separate yourself from from the past and which is a, it's, it's a very uh, it's very dramatic moment when you That's release right, an yeah. album because it's you know it's like you know sending your your uh, your your children in the world. I mean they're they're no longer <laughs> yeah, yeah. your children. I mean they're, they're they're out there and living their life. But I think that this is also a very important uh, moment uh, during this journey. But then I also That's agree right. that the the most important part is the journey itself. 
Thank you, Giovanni, for pointing out. Yeah, I agree with that also. It's really important also to have the releases in the future as an artist, I think, because, yeah, they're no longer our parts as well, and they will choose each of the ears in the world, so in the wild, of course. <laughs> Thank you very much for this uh, fascinating uh, conversation. And uh, I'd like to wrap everything up by asking uh, the, the question that we ask all the times. And uh, if you were able to choose the next Frap Tools module, uh, what would it be? Wow, okay, I have three different answers. I think I hope that's okay. <laughs> so the first one, <laughs> I think the first one, this is my dream, it's a sampler, of course, from uh, Fraptos, because I think that'll be great to uh, coordinate in the Fraptos ecosystems with the Austa, and then we have uh, the mixers, and then the Kunsa, of course, that's my also one of my dreams of the samples as well in the future, Kunsa also. I think the samplers also will open up the, uh, you know, uh, X, um, you know, like similarities and also all the options in the Fraptos ecosystem. So I think samplers is also, uh, I think I, I, I can imagine if it's, uh, it will be happening in 2024 or not, but maybe in the future, I think that'll be great. And also- Certainly um, not 2024. <laughs> <laughs> I hope so. I hope so in the near future. <laughs> well, we hope and then, so. Yeah, I think so. That'll be great. And then number two, I think this is a bit classic, but I think uh, Theremin. Mm. Theremin, I think. But of course, in the Fraptos um, way and Fraptos design and Fraptos ideas, it's not only Theremin and also not only the resurrecting about the old Theremin, but I think that'll be great if we can, if you can maybe incorporate that with the different aspects in Fraptos, I think that'll be great. Not only a standard theremin, but I think to, you know, um, to, I don't know, maybe you can answer that with theremin, but different aspect. And also the last one, I think that'll be great if you can um, Fraptos and uh, to bring about the granular synthesis, of course. I think it's also one of the uh, aspects of the synthesis um, methods of course, back in the past and also until now. But of course, uh, granular uh, synthesis, which is uh, incorporated with the Fraptos ecosystems and also um, difference of the, like, uh, which is already made by other companies. I think you can you can manage um, manage uh, three of them in the future, Giovanni and Fraptos then. <laughs> wow, they That's were, my dreams. <laughs> yeah, I mean, they were excellent uh, suggestions, quite, quite uh, demanding in terms of uh, R&D, I would say. <laughs> oh, hopefully, yeah, hopefully, all the best. I can also hear uh, uh, Simone's ears ringing when we mentioned the granular <laughs> synthesis because it's one of his fields of studies back in the days and he is a very... Uh, um, you know, strict on what is granular synthesis and what is not, right. because you have to go down to the grain of sound and That's this kind right. of thing. But, but uh, yeah, th these are excellent suggestions, especially the theremin. I was curious to um, see, I mean, with the sampler, I know your music is very much sampling based. And mm -hmm. uh, I can also see something of granular synthesis, for example, in the way you use the maybe the morphogen that you have and you should yeah. in the patch. But mm -hmm. what about the theremin? I think um, I will use it, for example, if there's a theremin from Fraptos, because I also incorporated co my vocal singing in Modular Synthesizer. Mm. I also sample it, sample it live uh, through, for example, morphogen, morphogen and also in assimilator. So I record that live in Morphogen and I chop all the samples and then use all the parameters in there. So with Theremin, I think I will use that to use it as the like a focal so I can play that in scale, for example, maybe with the help of maybe this is my fourth dreams in Fraptos is Ustar Mark II maybe in the future, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> so maybe you can incorporate that with scale with the theremin itself. So when whenever we're playing in the scale with the theremin itself, everything is being uh, quantized in uh, with the usta or maybe in the theremins in there. So we can play, for example, a pentatonic. Mm -hmm. 
So we can, I can, sim, I can um, recreating my focal stuff with the theremin, for example. If I theremin is the tools itself, but the sound sampling or maybe sound oscillator, we can use brand so for example. So everything is being connected with your ecosystem and environments of Raptos. I think that'll be great, Giovanni. Wow. Go, go, go. Wow. <laughs> 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 well, Ryan, I think that we can cap it here for for today, and um, we will meet again in Fraptus Studio, where I will try to uh, recreate, uh, well, to create a patch based on all the things that we discussed today, and uh, let's see if I can uh, create something in the style of Buzzeput. Oh, and, um, that'll be an honor for me. <laughs> we will see. Um, at the uh, after we say goodbye. There will be an, an I will edit the patch in uh, in this podcast and in this video. And for now, I think that I will just say thank you, thank you, thank you very much for joining us with this chat. You're welcome, Giovanni, and thank you, Fraptal Teams, for um, adding me into this wonderful episodes. And I believe in the future there will be so much, um, you know, interesting speakers and also fascinating musicians in modular synthesizer. I'm looking forward to learn more from your educational uh, contents and the videos on YouTube. Thank you so much. Okay, so we are back in Frapp Studio and this is the patch that uh, this conversation inspired me.
So since I don't have a sampler here and I've got an analog only setup, I had to be much more cautious as to how many voices and how many sound effects to use. So I choose to focus on three key elements. A uh, uh, very powerful bass, which is uh, here on channel two of the CGM. Instead of uh, a sine wave, I used a filtered sawtooth with some uh, resonance and a tracking filter that you can hear. And the second element I want to focus on is the sine wave uh, somehow acting as a middle voice, which I put here. And I achieved that with a self-oscillating filter. And I sent the envelope to the resonance amount, to the Q amount, so that the attack has a sort of glide. And then I also added an actual glide into the volt proactive signal. So by playing with the envelope, I can define the attack and also the glide, and somehow the glide between the nodes. And uh, I soaked it into a delay plus reverb that I programmed on the Empress Zoya. And it sounds like this. And the third element was, of course, the sample of a mallet instrument, of a percussion instrument, that is a key signature of Baseput sound. And I achieved that with a through zero FM patch on the brain so oscillator that sounds like this. This is filtered as well. It's, here's without re this is reverberated as well. This is without reverb. And uh, I randomized some notes so that the uh, both the note and the FM ratio gets different, but uh, I programmed an envelope to control both the FM amount and the filter to which the, um, the sound is patched. And uh, by using a Kunsas integrator, I have been able to give to the filter a longer curve than the one going to the FM amount, so it has a very natural kind of decay. I set the filter to 24 dB per octave, but maybe now that I think about it, also 12 could work great with a more sparkling kind of sound. And uh, to mimic the morphogen with a reversed playback of uh, Baseput samples, I patch the um, sample and hold, which is triggered by the, the, this sequence that we are hearing right now, to the envelope attack. And so uh, it will transform, I'm gonna manually play it, it will transform a very percussive sound into its reversed copy, like this. So it's a fake uh, reverse that I made in analog. And if we soak it into the reverb, it sounds like this. And all to everything all together sounds like this. I added some degree of randomization to this melody as well, and I also randomized the, the gates playing the percussion. On top of that, I just added a pinch of swing to the whole track, just the three percent, but everything just to make a more everything more glued together and with a more human feeling. I thank you very much for staying with us uh, for this very interesting uh, conversation and uh, make sure to listen also to the past episodes. They are available on Spotify, Google and YouTube and all the major streaming platforms. My name is Giovanni Grandi and thank you for listening. Let's talk music with Fraptus.